Good morning. I'm uh, Joe Canigliaro, the Chief of the Division of General Internal Medicine, and I have the honor of uh, introducing today's speaker. So Sandeep Kapoor is an Assistant <coughs> Professor of Medicine at Hofstra Northwell School of Medicine, and he's also Director of the Screening, Brief, Brief Intervention, and Referral to Treatment Program, or ESPERT, at Northwell Health. Uh, Sandeep's in a unique position. He has uh, been the glue that collaborates uh, the departments of internal medicine, emergency medicine, and psychiatry that integrates uh, protocols to universally screen and do brief interventions for alcohol and drugs, uh, as well as tobacco. We've been doing this in primary care settings and emergency room settings for the past three and a half, four years. It's been so successful that we've screened over 250,000 patients and we've done nearly 8,000 brief interventions since December 2013. In addition to the Sandeep's uh, clinical success uh, in putting this program and moving it forward, um, he has uh, worked professionally on uh, implementing an interdisciplinary uh, teaching program uh, in substance abuse by establishing a four-year curriculum uh, through the uh, Hofstra Northwell School of Medicine and we're working on a similar uh, program through the Nurse Practitioner School. He serves on the uh, Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration um, as a liaison uh, to us um, and that group. He's uh, worked with the New York State Office of Alcoholism and Substance Abuse Services, uh, and he works for the, uh, with the National Center on Addiction and Substance Abuse. He's a member of the uh, OASIS Expert Policy Advisory Committee, and he's on a number of district committees. Today's Grand Rounds is entitled Addressing Substance Abuse as Part of Usual Care, and focuses more on the opioid ep epidemic that we're, uh, so many of us are experiencing in our practices. Dr. Kapoor. Good morning, everybody. Um, I usually like moving around, but I can't because we're also teleconferencing in. So good morning to everybody on uh, the virtual end of things. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Canigliaro, Dr. McGinn, Dr. Gottridge, for the kind invitation. I'm uh, really excited to talk to you about a topic that truly is uh, at the doorsteps of our health system, uh, but more importantly, at the doorsteps of our communities. And um, before I get started, just really quickly, I have no financial, until 10 minutes ago, I have no financial or non-financial uh, <laughs> relationships with manufacturers that may be uh, discussed in today's presentation. Um, as Dr. Canigliaro mentioned, and I think um, he was very humble in really talking about me specifically, but I represent a very large team-based collaborative that spans multiple clinical and non-clinical departments in this health system, as well as folks uh, that are external grant partners, uh, New York State and the federal government. But really through the leadership of Dr. Canigliaro, Dr. Morgenstern from Addiction Services, and Dr. Kwan from Emergency Medicine, um, we've, we've been able to have some uh, great successes uh, but at the same time have had a lot of opportunities for lessons learned from our failures. And today we're not going to really highlight the work that we're doing, but really give you guys the opportunity to take a look at what options are available to you to incorporate into your clinical repertoire when dealing with patients that may be uh, unfortunately uh, dealing with addiction or dependence. I also want to highlight that about a year ago, uh, Northwell Health put together an opioid management steering committee chaired by Dr. Enden and executive sponsor Mark Jared. And really this committee, interdisciplinary, interprofessional, uh, again, clinical, non-clinical members of, of, the, uh, of the community here at Northwell, trying to work together to figure out how do we truly address the opioid epidemic. And I'm sure everyone in this room and everyone virtually has somewhat been affected by what we're seeing out in our communities, with our patients, potentially even with our own families. And as a system, it's really important for us to recognize that our hard work on the front lines, as well as uh, working with the decision makers in this health system, working together to figure out how do we stand up infrastructures? How do we stand up options so that we can better equip ourselves to take care of someone's mom, someone's brother, someone's cousin, and so on? So today's objectives uh, hopefully are pretty clear. I'm just, going to go around, I'm just going to go over the prevalence of substance use, abuse, and addiction. And then again, give you guys options of what you think you can incorporate based on what the system is trying to stand up, but even internally in your own practices or in your own uh, clinical settings. 
So I'm going to ask you guys just to take a moment and take a look at this uh, Wordle up there and really think about and reflect on what substance use means to you. When I say the word substance use, what's the first reaction you have? And with that said, think about the reactions your clinical teams have, because the majority of you are clinical team leaders in here. Think about how your nurses, your social workers, um, your technicians, what do they really think when you use the word substance abuse? And more so, how is that affecting us and delivery of optimal care when we start quoting or talking about folks in a different way? Where all of a sudden, somebody that's dealing with addiction is now an addict, and not our patient anymore, and not our neighbor, and not our family member. And the reason I put this up here, it's not to shame all of us. This is something that's just inbred into us, especially in our culture, through media, through entertainment. It, it, it's, it's something that we're uncomfortable with. And the only way we're going to be successful in standing up initiatives or standing up our own uh, personal kind of goals when dealing with addiction is really address this internally, personally. How do we look at this with a different lens? Are these patients or the folks dealing with addiction any different than folks that are dealing with diabetes, cardiovascular disease, carcinomas? So I'm going to move on to someone that I truly respect and learned a lot about through high school and so on, uh, Dr. Martin Luther King, with this quote, which is life's most persistent and urgent question is, what are you doing for others? And this question is easily answered by healthcare professionals, because we do a lot. But I want you guys to take one moment and replace others with folks dealing with addiction. And truly take account of what are we currently doing as a system, or personally in your own clinical settings for folks that may be dealing with addiction. So let me tell you a little bit about the prevalence of this disease. This is um, national statistics, but one in four people who started using alcohol, drugs, and tobacco before the age of 18 currently have a problem. One in four. Now when you compare that to one in 25 that started using the same substances after the age of 21. So now it highlights this is not only, some, uh, it doesn't only live in adult medicine. But it's an important conversation to have in pediatric and adolescent medicine. Exponential risk, one in four compared to one in 25. So we need to start having conversations earlier. 40 million people, so statistically speaking, one in seven in this room currently have a substance problem. One in seven. Now I ask you guys, <clears throat> think about medical school, residency, and all the other clinical training. How much training have you truly received to talk to these 40 million people? especially because we're primed to talk about all the other disease processes. I'm going to share some figures about the opioid epidemic uh, from ASAM. 260 million scripts were written for opioids in 2012, which is enough to give every adult American a bottle of pills. Four in five heroin users started with, and this is the key word, prescription medication. Four in five. And 30,000, and these figures are old now, unfortunately that number has gone up, 30,000 overdose deaths related to opioids uh, in 20, I think this is 2014. And if you really look at it, and now think about some of the perceptions we may have about overdose, where it's the needle in the arm, uh, the potential quote unquote frequent flyer that's uh, sleeping it off in the ED. But when you really look at it, 60% of those deaths were related to prescription painkillers, and only 30% were related to the traditional heroin. Something we really need to reflect on. Prescription painkillers. At the end of 2014, we were talking about 81 deaths a day related to the opioid epidemic. That's a 400% increase in 15 years. So by the time this grand round is over, we're talking about two deaths. And that number, by the way, is up to 102 currently per day. And let's bring it back home. New York State. New York State is one of many states that is dealing with the opioid epidemic. And it doesn't make a difference if you're from Staten Island or the Bronx, which are, quote unquote, the hot spots of the epidemic. But Suffolk County, Nassau County, Westchester, and North, every single county is facing a crisis. And these figures stop in 2014. But again, you do see close to a 400% increase. So same trajectory as the national figures. And again, if I had the 2015, 2016 numbers, those bars would keep going up. I think we're up to 1,500 last year. 
So what's the real issue? I touched upon it a little bit, which is what we may think about the word addict, what we may think about substance use in general. One in 10 people that actually need treatment receive it. Now, I'm sure I'm in the room full of very thoughtful people and virtually as well. Can you imagine if there were 10 people up here that had a heart attack and we picked one to treat? Unheard of. The major source of referrals out to specialty treatment are not healthcare professionals. And if it's all right to be a little bit interactive, can I ask the audience, what do you think the number one source of referrals to specialty treatment for addictions is? Family, great response. So family self-referral is actually number two, coming in around 20%. Legal system, absolutely. So close to 70%. Now we don't need to pull out our iPhones or Samsung devices. <laughs> but where does that leave us? 70% legal, 20% family and self-referrals. Where does it leave the thoughtful people in this room virtually and throughout our health system and nationally? Less than 7% of referrals are stemming from healthcare professionals. And again, this figure is kind of old. It's 2011. It hasn't really changed. And why is that? I'm going to ask you guys another question. If I can ask you to raise your hands if you've received over 10 hours of curricular time dedicated to addressing substance use, please raise your hand. I see two hands. How about over five hours? of dedicated curricular time through residency and med school. Awesome, a little bit more. Guys, on average, we're talking about two to three hours based on surveys of family medicine residency directors nationally. So Dr. Conigliaro mentioned that we've been very successful in introducing a four-year longitudinal curriculum around addressing substance use at Hofstra and hope to do this uh, at the nursing school as well. But this is really the root of the issue. If we can't first identify that substance use is a healthcare issue and not this moral or standalone psychiatry behavioral health issue, we're undercutting the process. And if we truly can't be open to enhancing our own awareness, the awareness of our clinical teams, as well as the awareness of our patients and their families, and in doing so building skill sets, but this is the kicker, this word right here, comfort. I'll tell you right now, if I'm not comfortable talking about something, I'm sure the person I'm talking to is not going to be comfortable. So how do we get back to truly educating ourselves and training ourselves to feel comfortable about addressing substance use with our patients? And that's why today uh, is actually a very important touch point or time point on this journey that we're on. So let me just tell you a little bit about the healthcare issue that substance use or substance abuse truly is. And truly, I'm going to focus on an issue with healthcare first. So what's the issue with healthcare? One, we know that revenue and we know that dollars mean a lot. Yet when we look at statistics, a third of inpatient hospital costs are linked to addiction and risky substance use. You think that in itself would be enough for us to stand up as a community of healthcare providers beyond Northwell in New York State and the country to do more. Yet, less than two cents, two pennies, are spent on prevention and treatment out of all healthcare costs. That doesn't make sense. That's a big mismatch. So my question is, can we approach this like other chronic diseases? Where if I were to have a knee surgery tomorrow, over the next six months, I probably will get six phone calls to find out how I'm doing, if I'm in pain, if there are any signs of infection, I probably will have a follow-up appointment. Yet, if I come in, rescued on naloxone from an overdose, intentional or non-intentional. What are we doing for patients once they leave our EDs, our emergency departments? Just something to think about. And the answer is truly yes, we can look at this as a chronic disease. And to better illustrate this point, I'm gonna ask you guys to please look at this blue triangle as a journey, where the broad end is the beginning of this journey and the narrow end is further along the journey. The black lines are touch points on this journey. And for today's example, we'll talk about type two diabetes. We know very well that you don't wake up one day and you are diagnosed with diabetes. There's a journey. And what do we do? We take advantage of every single black line there to screen our patients. And if something's irregular with their blood sugar, 
with their BMI, with their nutrition, what do we do? We intervene. We talk to them. We talk to them about their blood sugar, their uh, nutrition, and their weight. And if that doesn't work, we get other folks involved. Endocrinology, nutritionists, dietitian. And if that doesn't work, potentially medication. We're primed to do this. And we know that if we don't take advantage of every touch point, we will have much higher numbers of diagnosed patients with diabetes and potentially a higher number of folks at high risk who are uh, not adherent to medication. Their diet's out of control. They have comorbid disorders. So I ask you guys to challenge yourselves to think about substance use the same way. I am not going to wake up tomorrow all of a sudden addicted to painkillers or to cocaine or to alcohol. There is a journey here. And I guess the challenge really comes in is how do we take advantage of every single touch point with our patients? Folks that are coming to us seeking help with trusted members of the community, how do we take advantage to even take the simple step of understanding their substance use status? And not only understanding their substance use status at that touch point, but every other touch point we see them. And how do we intervene with them if something's irregular, the same way we do with other disease processes? And not only serve the folks, by the way, only 5% of the population truly are dealing with dependence or addiction. How do we not only figure out how to serve folks dealing with addiction, but better yet, how do we prevent the addiction? How do we work towards building communication strategies, treatments, interventions, using technology? How do we support our patient population, our families, to not progress down that journey? And again, the face of addiction that we may stereotypically think looks like is non-existent. It could be me. It could be one in seven of us in this room. So if we cherry pick a certain stereotypical patient that we think needs some sort of conversation, we're already, again, undercutting the process, knowing that very few people are dealing with dependence and addiction compared to the folks that are at risk. So at this time, I want to transition a little bit. I gave you a good historical account of what's going on in our communities and with our patient population. But I want to actually now turn this into more of a positive note about what can we add into our own toolbox. And today, again, is an opportunity to kind of highlight some of the things that have been done in the health system. So there are proven models that we can further disseminate, but some things that actually haven't been implemented yet. And today, Hopefully, we can identify early adopters or champions that will take on this as one of their clinical duties and diversify your own portfolio. So I'd be remiss if I don't talk about early identification and prevention because obviously ESPERT or screening brief intervention referral to treatment is very close to my heart and our team's heart. But truly, I want to highlight early identification, prevention, potential options for treatment, and then also follow-up. So ESPER, as Dr. Conigliaro mentioned, it truly is a team-based effort. And what it allows us to do is using very simple evidence-based screening tools to identify and potentially intervene with patients that may be dealing with consequences of their alcohol or drug use, self-identified consequences. The way we've implemented this throughout primary care and emergency medicine is truly a team-based uh, process, where if you look up there, hopefully your clinical practice is up there, but I want to highlight two really quickly. One, health coach. So we establish expert health coaches, which are pretty much the majority of them non-licensed professionals that we've embedded into clinical teams to have sensitive conversations, build rapport within seconds, at point of service, to talk about a patient's substance use. And I just want to highlight dietitian. What? Yeah. North Shore Hospital's <laughs> dietitians all got trained on how to address substance use, North Shore University Hospital. Just think about nutrition, diet, and how much alcohol and drugs can really hinder behavioral change when it comes to nutrition. And these guys came to us to ask us to get better trained. And I think I just, I just have to highlight that because that was very new for us. Uh, Dr. Kunigar already mentioned the numbers, but one thing I just want to highlight, the over 200,000, close to 250 now, was frontline medical office assistants and frontline nurses in the emergency department. Medical office assistants standing up, going beyond their normal scope that we may pigeonhole them to, 
And now they are the first person to ask our patients about their alcohol and drug use. Team-based approach. Brief interventions we talked about. I want to highlight this last number. Over 3,000 3, people through this whole process have been identified as that risky, high-risk, end-of-spectrum kind of category. And this is going to blow your mind. Half to 3,000, primary care. So when I hear, or our colleagues hear, not my patient, quote unquote, yeah, our patients. Half those numbers are primary care. Pre-screening done by frontline RNs, MAs. Uh, full screening done by a health coach or social work care management. And a brief intervention and potentially a referral to treatment. That's the protocol. I'm not going to really go into too much detail other than highlight what a brief intervention is. Because this, by far, is something that we can add into everyone's clinical portfolio. It is a structured, non-judgmental, non-confrontational uh, non conversation, brief, lasting anywhere from 5 to 20 minutes, where you allow the patient to truly elicit and truly evoke from them what they may feel is a consequence related to their drinking. And if there is a consequence, are they ready or willing to even make the slightest amount of change for harm reduction? Four easy steps, raise the subject, provide feedback, enhance motivation, and negotiate and advise. And really using the model of the stages of change. And not just understanding at what part or what um, stage of change they're at, but then challenging ourselves to put our agenda aside and actually meeting the patient where they're at. So you're using the spirit of motivational interview and you're building that partnership using compassion, accepting what they're saying, and truly evoking from them what they think is relevant. And that consequence could be health-related, my blood pressure, my blood sugar, or it could be something not health-related. And that's important for us to understand. Behavioral health, psychosocial issues. I'm late to my job all the time. I'm really stressed because my kids are partying too much. I'm having issues with my spouse. Don't tell my wife I said that. But there's so many different things that we need to address as providers of health. I'm going to share some quick outcomes with you guys. And I want to share this with a really a big sense of humility and also to ensure that we're not being disingenuous. But we followed up with close to 220 patients that were identified as using alcohol at primary care and emergency medicine settings. And of the 220 patients at baseline, the average patient was drinking 12 days out of the past 30. When we followed up with them at six months, 40% reduction in drinking. Drugs. 150 patients, give or take. About 16 days or 15 days in the past 30, followed up six months later, we're talking about 10, 30% reduction. Now, Espert had a part in that because we had a conversation. We just did some thoughtful data collection, brief intervention, possibly a referral to treatment. But can you imagine? Can anyone actually do a chart review right now in your own practice and let me know if you can track longitudinally how your patient is drinking or using drugs? I'm sure the answer is no. I mean, we built this into many EHRs for this single purpose. Just like we can longitudinally track hemoglobin A1C and so many other important markers, this just highlights that there is successes in addressing substance use every single time universally. Our clinical work has now trickled into Hofstra School of Medicine. And I just want to say, Larry Smith, Dr. Smith, the communications faculty that's here, oops, um, they've been very open to us identifying, not only identifying a gap in clinical education, but truly standing up supports to fill that gap, where we went from a two-hour footprint in the curriculum of four years of medical school on addressing alcohol and some risky use, to now, this year, over a 12-hour curriculum, including a two-week elective, if they want to work with an interprofessional team in primary care, emergency medicine, and with Bruce Goldman at Zucker Hillside Hospital Substance Abuse Services. And the beauty is, we actually completely manifested the same procedures that we have on our clinical end in the educational end, where we're using interdisciplinary, interprofessional members of our teams, communications faculty, expert clinical faculty from all three departments, and expert health coaches to go into the School of Medicine to train the next generation of clinicians. Expert health coaches, non-licensed professionals teaching in medical school with us. Unheard of. And just a really quick snapshot of some of the evaluation we do, 
More confident asking patients about substance use, significant. More confident with assessing patient readiness to change, significant. This is from a self-report from our students pre and post of our sessions. Now, I should have highlighted this before, but that yellow star up in the top, I guess left or depending which way you're looking at, right corner. This is an opportunity for you guys to get trained. It's an educational opportunity. We developed a four year, uh, four year, geez, a four hour online course, start and stop on demand. You will get free CME, CEU, CE, whatever credits your profession uh, allows you to receive for free to get trained up on how to provide expert services, how to better screen patients, how to learn the spirit of motivational interviewing, and truly how to better serve our patients that may be dealing with addiction or substance misuse. And I'll share that, uh, we'll, we'll email it out. Okay, I'm gonna move on to prevention and talk to you about naloxone. Um, naloxone, better known as Narcan out there, opioid antagonist. It reverses the effects of sedation and respiratory depression, truly what an overdose does to a patient, and causes sudden withdrawal, which uh, unpleasant feeling, and Dr. Auerbach is here for emergency medicine, I'm sure he could describe what that looks like. But this drug, this medication, can truly help extend a patient's life. And there's two options. Either we can co-prescribe, or we can use built-in structure or implement built-in structure that we're doing in the health system, something called NALSAT, which is our naloxone saturation campaign. But I'm gonna go over co-prescribing, because this is something you can start tomorrow. So based on studies, and there was a great study done, which was a two-year non-randomized intervention study out in California, where they took six primary care locations, and out of 2,000 adults re receiving long-term uh, opioid therapy, they were able to prescribe about, that's about a third of the patients with naloxone. So really an intranasal or intramuscular rescue kit. What they found is at six months, there was 47% fewer opioid-related visits to the ED in their safety net community. And at one year, 63% fewer opioid-related ED visits. So what I would ask everyone to think about is if you are going to prescribe, why not potentially co-prescribe with some education for the patient or family member on how to use a rescue kit? Because we know a lot of overdoses are unintentional. It could be somebody that gets their hands on the meds and are overdosing in your living room. And having that available as an antidote, just like the EpiPen, could truly help patients. Now, this just tells us some, and there was a lot of limitations with this study, I didn't want to go over them, but um, I will go over the follow-up study that they did with their patients. So out of the 695 patients, about 10% were followed up. And if you can imagine, 97% believe that patients prescribed opioids for pain should be offered naloxone. Patient's choice, right? Patients don't have to accept it, but at least be offered it. 57% positive response to being offered naloxone. And one of the biggest barriers with NALSAT that we're running, as well as code prescribing, is, hey, if I give my patient naloxone, they're going to start using riskier because now they have a get out of free jail card. Well, there were no harmful behavior changes reported from our patients. Oh, I'm not our patients, their patients. And something to think about. A simple kit that takes about two seconds to put together can extend a patient's life from death until they get into the emergency department or until first responders respond. So I'll go over NALSAT really quickly because this is something that on a system level now we're trying to disseminate. So we talked about ESPERT, and if you can imagine superimposing another protocol on top of ESPERT where every patient our health coaches, social worker, care managers are, are addressing substance use with, they're offering them a naloxone rescue kit in-house. Primary care, Dr. Canigliaro's crew, our group over here in Division of General Internal Medicine are by far gonna be the innovators and the pioneers for New York State in handing out naloxone rescue kits free of charge to patients at point of service readily. And I think that's something we need to highlight because we've, we've seen a lot of success in our emergency departments already. And what we've done, like I said, we offer it to everybody that's expert positive and then non-licensed or licensed clinical team members can actually educate a patient or family member and hand the kit out with the standing order in place. New York State has a rule. 
You do not need to be a licensed professional to hand out this kit. What we've seen in 10 months, 426 kits handed out truly by probably about four people in the cell system. 71% to patients and 29% to family, friends, and staff. So when we, went li when we went live in Southside Emergency Department, that number was close to 25% was going to staff. Our nurses, our docs, our ED techs, social workers coming up to our health coach saying, you know what, I know somebody, my family member, my neighbor, my cousin, can you train me on this and give me a kit? Further emphasizing the point that this is not just an issue within our health system, but also in our homes. Okay, another option, educate patients on safe disposal. So as this little infographic tells you, it is really unsafe to us, for us to flush down or in our sink any unused or expired medication. Because unfortunately, and there's a lot of studies to show this, especially up in Massachusetts and um, uh, New Hampshire, it's going to come back to hurt us. So what do we do? Well, there are options. But the thing is, why are we doing it? Is it really because we want our folks that the minute they're done with their script to throw it away? Yes, because our medicine cabinets are hotspots for misuse and potential sale. If you look at literature out there about adolescents that start misusing drugs, that's probably their number one go-to. So how do we get rid of everything that's in our medicine cabinets right now that are expired or we're holding on to for a rainy day well, there's not a lot of options out there, to be honest with you. The DEA with local counties, they may set up once or twice a year a drop-off, but the problem is DEA, right? The law's involved. If I pull up to a police station, a lot of police stations, Port Washington being one of them, has drop-offs, but if I pull up to that facility with tinted windows or a warrant or something else, that's a deterrent for me to actually get rid of what I have. So what else can we do? Well. I, you know, the brand name doesn't matter, but there's a company that, that came up with a disposal pack. Holds 10, 15 pills, has a little activated charcoal thing inside, where if you just put some water in and seal it, shake it, you could actually toss it away in the garbage without affecting the environment. This is something that we're working very closely with Dr. Enden and other folks in the health system to bring into our health system so that not only can we potentially co-prescribe naloxone, but even possibly give these out, or even at the pharmacy, give these out so patients can dispose of medications. And this is not just about opioids. Expired penicillin does a lot of damage too. So why not get rid of that? Another option is this pilot program, the MedSafe. So the folks that create the Sharps containers, those little yellow and red containers that we use all around, they created MedSafe. It looks like a mailbox. Hopefully no one drops their mail in there. But it looks like a mailbox. And really what it allows for folks to drop off, patients, family members, staff members, to drop off unused prescriptions at a safe location. Currently, our pilot site is Southside Hospital's lobby. So if you walk into the lobby, right in front of security, under a watchful camera, is a med safe. And it's available for anyone to use. And it's really simple, because the pharmacy team there, they're chartered to actually go unlock that box, wrap up what's in it, and instantly call the number. That company comes, picks up, liabilities out of our hands, and we pay a very low monthly fee. So it's another support that we can talk to our patients about. Okay. One thing I forgot to put in here, or I think the slide's missing, is something that Dr. Canigliaro and team are working on, which is the prescriber guidelines. And that really comes down to prevention. How do we better prescribe to our patients? Using the opioid risk tool built into, elect uh, into electronic health record, using contracts with patients, doing some follow-up, thoughtful follow-up, potential urine testing. So there's a lot coming downstream that we're gonna pilot in the Division of General Internal Medicine and up in Phelps. So together with different patient populations, take a look at if we can implement the CDC guidelines that have been tailored by Dr. Marist and Dr. Liu in Division of General Internal Medicine, how do we pilot this for, for system-wide dissemination? Okay, let me move on to treatment, because this is key. And again, I'll just highlight the little star in the corner because there is a training opportunity here. Medication-assisted treatment. And I wish, actually, I, I, I had the foresight to just get rid of medication-assisted and just call it treatment. So medication-assisted treatment helps normalize brain chemistry, blocks the euphoric effects of alcohol and opioids, and really relieves some of those psychological cravings 
without the negative effects. FDA approved for opioid and alcohol use disorders. And the research suggests that using MAT, so medication uh, assisted treatment, can improve patient survival and retention in treatment, decrease substance use, increase the ability to gain and maintain employment, which I'm sure you understand what the landscape looks like right now out there. And as a result of decreased IV use, change different comorbid factors that put folks at risk, HIV, hepatitis, and so on. There are options out there, readily available. Methadone being one. Obviously, this is mainly done in opioid treatment programs, but it's been working, and it works really well. And we have a program right down the street at Zucker. Buprenorphine, so Suboxone, the mix of buprenorphine and naloxone together, acting as a partial agonist and a partial antagonist at the receptor. And because of the naloxone mix in there, if there is the attempt to inject this medication, it completely causes withdrawal, right? Because naloxone blocks, oops, naloxone blocks the receptor completely. Very dynamic medication that we really should start considering can we include into our, our uh, private practice or our clinical settings up in the hospital. And I'll just say really quickly that nationwide of the eligible people that can get trained up on buprenorphine, physicians, NPs, and PAs, less than 5% have actually completed the training. And Dr. Conigliaro and Dr. Karane and many others, Dr. Karane from Staten Island, they did a system-wide survey of over 300 participants that responded, physicians, NPs, and PAs. And we're doing a little bit better. Out of those 300, 8% were trained up in buprenorphine. So a little bit better than the national statistics. However, of those 8%, less than five patients a year. And we know that there's a lot more than five patients that we're seeing uh, or more than in our own um, clinical settings that are dealing with this issue. Naltrexone, Vivitrol. So this is a big push all of a sudden to start Vivitrol in the emergency department. But one thing folks are forgetting is abstinence for seven to 10 days. So Vivitrol does have a place um, and it does work very well, but we have to be cautious on how we approach this. And truly buprenorphine for primary care, for general medicine, family medicine, is an, an option we should really consider. And when I say that, here's a learning opportunity. Free buprenorphine waiver trainings for physicians, practitioners, and physician assistants. New York State provides this. Better yet, we just received a supplement on the HRSA impact grant to actually train primary care and, and medicine physicians, PAs, and NPs, so that we can get more capacity to provide buprenorphine to our patients. Just some quick figures on some studies. Naltrexone, Suboxone, Suboxone for teens and youths, and Methadone. Opioid-free on medication is the first column, percent of opioid-free patients. And percent opioid-free, so this is comparing medi medication-assisted treatment versus non-medication-assisted treatment in randomized, randomized control trials. So the evidence is there. Now, one of the limitations is when we talk about medication-assisted treatment, we can't stop there. And I thank Bruce Goldman for this because he made this point to me, and it's really important. The gold standard is not MAT alone. It is a combination of MAT and those psychosocial interventions. The touch point with substance abuse services or with primary care to talk to patients, to understand where they're at, what their current substance use status is, even if they're on one of these medications. Alcohol use disorder, or even risky alcohol use. And again, not to plug it, but this is where Espert really helps us. If we can identify someone's at risk, we could potentially think about giving them some medication because we're treating them for so many other things already. Disulfiram, I'm sure everyone's used, uh, is understanding of this, but it really is a deterrent to drinking, evokes a very bad reaction, but then compliance is a big issue. Because if I don't like that reaction and I like drinking, I am not going to take that medication. Another option is now Trexone, orally. It helps drink less or stop drinking. And the mechanism, mechanism of action is a, a bit unknown, but what it does, it, it blocks that euphoric effect of drinking. So if you drink, you're not getting that reward. Extended release, Vivitrol, so this is if um, adherence is an issue, and acamprosate. Now, I just want to highlight naltrexone really quickly, because one of the things that we're trying to do, and a lot of this, again, 
A lot of this is not in play right now, but how do we figure out as a system, as a community of healthcare providers to stand up processes and protocols? Well, one of the things that we're doing is project reduce. So reducing drinking using collaborative efforts, trying to build a collaborative care model, including primary care, including uh, behavioral health and psychiatry, addiction services, working together to figure out how do we best serve patients that may be using alcohol in a risky way. Not truly addiction, but a risky way that may lead to addiction. And Dr. Morgenstern, Dr. Kingliaro, a bunch of our team here are working on this, and part of this research study is the use of naltrexone. And 865 Northern Boulevard has already prescribed naltrexone outside of this study to patients that are dealing with alcohol misuse. So it is an option that's very tangible and something that can get started fairly quickly. Okay, key. We can't treat everybody in primary care. Right? We already said, even with MAT, we need some sort of additional touch points, some sort of thoughtful co combination of effort. So how do we familiarize ourselves with our internal providers of care and our external providers of care? So Northwell Health does have great capacity. The question is, are we capitalizing on it? Are we facing barriers? Are we able to access? And if that's an issue, I would love to hear from you. Dr. Morgan Cern, Director of Addiction Services, would love to, Dr. Canigliaro, Bruce Coleman, we would all love to hear from you because we have the ability to figure out different ways to allow you to gain access to services that we have in-house. Zucker Hillside, South Oaks Hospital, Phelps Memorial, Staten Island University Hospital, our central hubs for substance abuse services. Now, again, going back to patient's choice, willingness, readiness, I gotta pick up my kids at 6 p.m. I, I work out in Far Rockaway. These facilities may not always work. So what's the next thing we're doing? Well, we're going beyond the boundaries of our health system and really truly building partnerships with community-based organizations. We're increasing capacity, giving more options to our patients, and expanding what we highlighted before, that team-based approach. So it's not just in-house, but involves members of our communities, substance abuse services, social services, folks that are truly invested in improving the landscape of addiction. Okay, follow-up. So I will just say really quickly, in development, huge issue. And we're working as a team to figure out how do we develop specialized care management. Like I mentioned the knee surgery before, how do we do the same thing for folks that are dealing with addiction thoughtfully? Utilization of health information exchanges. So having all scripts talk to another EHR out in the community or even at Zucker. How do we do that? Partnerships with community-based organizations and truly efforts like Esper, where we can continually follow up in a structured, non-confrontational way with our patients to understand where they're at the time that they're seeing us. So with all that said, I hope I've been able to give you a good understanding of what's going on out there, and I'm sure you guys are not surprised by it, but also hopefully equip you with an understanding of what's available to you and what you can incorporate into your own clinical repertoire. You know, together, we can work to align a community of potential solutions. And I say the word potential, because there is no one standalone solution, and even solution is kind of misleading. What we're trying to do is build an infrastructure, build capacity so that we can better treat our patients. Esper, naloxone saturation, prescriber guidelines, treatment, care management, navigation, follow-up. It has to be a multi-pronged effort. And I look forward to hearing from you guys if anyone's interested. I'm going to end on this slide. And the reason being, I was born in New York. I grew up here. I have family here. And what's going on out there is something that we truly can emotionally connect to and hopefully channel that emotion and bring it into our own clinical setting so that we can do better by our patients that may be dealing with addiction. I want to thank you guys very much for the time. I, I really appreciate it. And if there's any questions or comments, I'm more than happy to help respond. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kapoor, for an excellent talk this morning. We'll take some questions. What about advertising? We see ads for how to sue people or to get your cancer cured or get the right x-rays. Don't see anything about this. Yeah, so great question. I'll do my best to respond uh, without getting political about it. But 
Um, again, our culture here uh, in New York and throughout the country, um, it really is this barrier that we're facing. Because if we're trying to treat patients yet out in the community, you go on any MTA bus and you see signs for alcohol. You go to any ball game and take your kid, you see Budweiser and all these other ads. Better yet, I was at a talk a couple of weeks ago and they were handing out bottles of water. And the bottles of water were actually shaped as flasks, like the little naggins that you buy of, of, of vodka. So I don't really know how to respond to that. What I will say, though, is that the advertising that we're seeing now is very deceptive. So if you have a problem with addiction, call 1-800 and so on, so on. It's become a business where folks are being shipped out to Florida or other states to get treatment that they could receive here. And what we're finding is that the lax laws in those states are actually making the problem worse. Folks are overdosing in those environments. So I think that marketing, um, advertising, but truly maybe even working internally with our own PR to start raising awareness of the community. And Terry Lynham from PR is actually working on multiple initiatives. I, I will add, though, we just worked as a team on a five-series podcast with some journalists. Had no journalistic control over editing at all. And it was really actually very eye-opening to hear family stories, patient stories, and also stories of our health system. Um, it's called The Fix from Ground Truth. Anyone can Google it. Uh, it's free. But it really was uh, an exciting and invigorating kind of report by journalists, neutral, uh, about the addiction uh, epidemic as well as what we're trying to stand up. I hope that it answers your question. I apologize if it doesn't. Uh, the New York City Department of Health is actually running TV ads now um, with the number to call for treatment within New York City, the same way they run like the tobacco ads. Yeah, thank you for that. So New York State has a hope line um, that folks can call for some sort of navigation or some sort of assistance. In Suffolk County, there's an organization named LICAD. They also have a call center or a crisis center that you can call into. Um, but I'm not sure if that answers your question. Sorry. Maybe we could talk after. Thank you for a very informative talk. Thank you. My question is that the interaction between an affected individual, call him patient or what, and our resources that you have described is an episodic and time-limited exposure. But the person is exposed to the environment the rest of the 23 hours a day and seven days a week. And in spite of all the community outreach outside our system-wide resources, still, in my view, the person is, is still completely exposed to uh, failures. And do we have in our system a follow-up, not necessarily on an hourly basis, but several times a day with the social work or professionals to keep after those individuals continuously? Uh, yeah, so thank you for the question. I'll just repeat it in case others didn't hear. Do we have any thoughtful, structured follow-up with our patients via care management, social worker, or, or anybody on our clinical team? And I have to be honest with you, um, that's what we're working towards, exactly what you described. So really setting our patients up for success so that it's not just a conversation with their primary care doc or their hospitalist, but truly there's outreach, active outreach on behalf of the health system to f understand what environmental factors or social determinants that they're dealing with so that we could better equip them for success. Um, in development, by far, and these measures that I've described, um, Esper, just being one little piece of it, are driving those conversations and igniting those conversations throughout the health system so that we can stand up resources and dedicated resources to address this with our patients. I mean, I can't thank you enough for the question because it really does highlight a huge gap in clinical care, and slowly with baby steps, we're trying to fill it. You guys are making Dr. Buddhist run. <laughs> so just to address that, um, one of the things that we are piloting right now in the Project Reduce is using um, text messages over the course of the day, every day, for patients to help track their drinking um, and to make them aware, some motivational and some 
to actually track the numbers of drinking in the settings when they do. So we are trying to find ways that we can use the resources that um, are available and build on them to address just that issue because it is such an important factor. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Morgan. Can I just piggyback that really quickly? So Dr. Morgan Stern from Addiction Services, I'm name dropping like nuts, but, and Dr. Munch, who is um, one of our digi digital health folks, they're developing a platform um, which really is virtual where folks that are dealing with alcohol misuse, not truly addiction, but misuse or risky use, um, can engage virtually with health coaches, with this text messaging service that Dr. Morley's talking about, so that there is not just a one-way conversation, but there's active communication. And they've done some great research studies to show that even using geo-positioning, so let's say you have a patient that is on the road to recovery and, you know, an abstinence, let's just say, and they're walking by a favorite bar, walking by a favorite bar that they go to, all of a sudden activating their phone, sending a message saying, hey, can you reach out or can we talk? So there's a lot of research being done currently. There's a lot of technology that we're trying to develop currently uh, so that we can build capacity. But it has to be met, I agree with you, with care management, social work, support, and an infrastructure. Yes. Um, I want to thank you for such an important topic that you're putting to the forefront. Um, I've been dealing with this um, in my personal life with a family member addicted to heroin for many years, um, as well as now I, I do outpatient palliative care. And when I started this, I didn't realize I would walk into such a, a problem with the chronic pain world. Um, people are coming to me because their providers are no longer prescribing opiates and they're desperate. Um, so I wonder if our task force is thinking about other aspects of chronic pain management, what I'm, what I'm realizing is that we don't have good um, factors that, uh, treatment modalities that are covered, acupuncture, um, other um, alternative treatments for, uh, for chronic pain. I wonder if there's any stance on medical marijuana. Um, I'm finding I am in just my own cohort of patients decreasing opioid use um, in chronic pain patients and even cancer patients using medical marijuana. I don't know what the health system thinks about all this. Yeah, great question. And I'll do my best to address it, but I'm probably not the right person. Um, but I'm more than happy to navigate a response for you. What I will say is part of the charter of the Opioid Management Steering Committee is to figure out how do we build capacity for the non-opioid pain management. Um, there is a pilot going on at Southside right now for perioperative care um, to really look at the way that we're prescribing and maybe using different meds or different techniques. Um, but I agree, you know, talking about physical therapy, talking about uh, yoga, acupuncture, all these different things, it's great to talk about. But as a system, do we have the capacity to support patients? Um, again, on this journey that we're on, we're identifying a lot of gaps. Um, but with baby steps, we're trying to backfill. And, you know, somebody asked me, or someone actually introduced our team and said, oh, wow, you guys are really innovative. You're really getting ahead of this. And my first response is, we're actually playing damage control. We're not getting ahead of anything at this point. So I think you raised an important issue, and I know you're, you've been involved with our other initiatives. I would welcome you to join so that we could truly brainstorm and navigate potential solutions. Thank you for the question. Um, great presentation. I'm glad yes. I was here. Um, we have this new integrative health center at Northwell in Roslyn now, and most people don't know about it. And they do all types of um, stress reduction, Reiki, yoga, meditation, mindfulness. And it's open to Northwell for referrals. And we have to think about using some of these techniques in addition to, of course, your medication treatment. Um, I have a relative uh, who was addicted to pain meds is now a methadone who's miserable. And I really have to like find her a life coach, I think, sort of what Dr. Rye is saying, like somebody to guide her 23 hours a day, how she can move forward. So we do have integrative health for the first time at Northwell, and I think we need to take more use of that. There's a really good people there. So if you haven't toured that facility, they're open to visitors. Yeah, thank you, Alice. And um, so that was a much better response that I could have given you because there are some resources obviously available. I know about it. I visited it. Um, it's in Roslyn, um, and it's beautiful. Um, they don't accept every insurance for their acupuncture. I have sent plenty of patients to them. I have to admit it's very foofy. Um, it's it's a high it's a high class clientele. Most of my patients who are you know Medicaid or non insured. Cannot, it's not reasonable. Um, it's a great resource for some patients, but it's not for all, unfortunately. 
But there is opportunity to bring a, a satellite facility to Northwell through Katz Wilman's Hospital. Um, I think this whole thing is a secret. I'm not exactly sure why politically. It but, isn't anymore. Well, <laughs> I'll probably get into trouble. I have some nasty emails. <laughs> Maybe I'll retire early. Who knows? Um, but um, possible. So I think I'm very attached to this place for de professional reasons. I and I also took mindfulness there. But I think that um, there's opportunity to bring the services to Northwell. I agree with the ambiance. <laughs> I suggest all of us in this room go there. It's very nice. But um, I could see how some patients. But we have the opportunity. We have all these clinics. We just have to make space. You know, one of the issues is having physical space to do these things. Thanks, Alice. I don't need the mic. I don't need the mic. Okay. I'll repeat your question for the virtual folks. Actually, Dr. Case, you've got to get you the mic because I'm not going to be able to remember everything you're saying for the virtual folks. Uh, just uh, for LAJ so they can hear it too. Okay. So there's a concept um, of hot spotting where in ambulatory medicine you take a look at your entire panel of patients and you figure out from some of the metrics in the practice who are the patients that are at greatest risk, highest risk patients for utilization. I almost wonder if you could take some of the concepts of that to patients who screen positive at their right initial questions about substance use, create a panel in a, in a practice or in the network and figure out who really is at the highest risk and then connect with them in a community-based way and connect with them in the home um, very often. Um, but my worry is to take innovations like that, all of our innovations, when people are asked that initial question when they're screened, I'm curious, in our system, in all the expert sites, what percentage of folks are answering yes to opiates? Not necessarily to alcohol, but to opiates. My guess is the incidence is so high and that at the screening question point, there's a lot of reticence to say yes. And it calls for higher communication skills to massage that information out of a patient that you're meeting for the first time or the second time. But I am curious about the incidence of opiate uh, confirmation with the initial questioning um, in our area. I'm yeah, curious. yeah, great question. And, you know, first, if I could address the first point, absolutely. I mean, if we had uh, a high-risk team, if you will, uh, around this, yeah, I think we would see better successes. And, again, to the doctor's point before, have outreach and some sort of thoughtful follow-up. Um, I don't know the numbers offhand, but what I will say is it, it varies by site and patient population. So Lenox Hills, Greenwich Village, we have a very high pre-screen positive rate of close to 30% of the patients that are first initially asked questions and are responding at a level of, of risk. Um, but then if you go into primary care, we're looking at anywhere from 10 to 15%. So I do think that the initial asking of the question is our critical time point. And that's why we do some thoughtful training with our MAs and frontline nurses and refresh it and refresh it. Because the biggest thing that we're fighting is that stigma. And we're not going to solve stigma by perpetuating it. Um, so, you know, the folks that may be dealing with an issue, first and foremost, folks probably don't even know they're dealing with an issue with alcohol, number one. Um, and then two, if they are, do they feel comfortable? Are we creating opportunities for patients to talk to us, or are we creating comfortable opportunities for patients to talk to us? So the numbers, I'm more than happy to get to you. I just don't have them offhand. But there is significant responses from our patients. And of the 8,000 brief interventions that I highlighted, that actually is trickled down from close to, I would say, 18,000 patients that were addressed, uh, that were actually thoughtfully um, uh, uh, interviewed, yet they were not using at a high risk or uh, at, at, at risk category. And, uh, LIJ, any questions over there? You guys really cleared out. There are no questions on LIJ. <laughs> Sorry. You guys here? Say it again. There are no questions at LIJ. Oh, okay. <laughs> awesome. Oh, wow, I'm on TV over there. That's pretty cool. <laughs> All right. Any other questions here at North Shore? All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. Thank you.